Hi, this is the last of the videos looking at applications of Gauss's law. So in this video, instead of looking at spherical or cylindrically symmetric arrangement, we are going to look at geometries that exhibit what you might call rectangular symmetry or Cartesian symmetry, or you could call it planar geometry. So here, we are not looking for rotational symmetries anymore. Instead, this is what the geometry looks like. Let me draw two views, a perspective view and a side view. Sort of imagine bring up the plane and you're just looking at it at the light level. We can say that this charge distribution has uniform surface charge density, sigma naught. So if we are dealing with an infinitely large plane, this geometry has translational symmetry. It has translational symmetry for two directions. Basically, the two directions that the plane is not perpendicular to. Because for those two directions, you can move the infinite plane however much, and nothing will have changed. And as before, it's useful to draw electric field lines to kind of see what kind of symmetry you can exploit exists. And as before, we can use a symmetry argument to prove important features of these field lines. For example, we can prove that there is no concentration of field lines in one area, because if it did, it would violate the translational symmetry. You translate the whole system, charge distribution doesn't change, but this special region needs to move. So you can say that electric field as a function of x or y is constant. That's the only way you can obey the translational symmetry. And we can continue to use reflection symmetry to rule out weird looking electric field lines like this. Then we imagine doing reflection that flips everything around, flips the electric field around, but the charge distribution didn't change, that's contradiction, so can happen. So this is the electric field lines that we are left with that's consistent with the symmetry of the system. Now, the question as before is still the same. What is the electric field? And to use Gauss's law, once again, we need to define a Gaussian surface. So let's say we are looking at a point here. We are looking at what is the electric field at this point. And since we have a rectangular symmetry, we are going to need to pick a rectangular surface. So from this side view, that surface will look like this. It's very carefully chosen. I will go over it in a little bit. Or uh, let me draw this in the perspective view so that you have some idea of what the three-dimensional shape of this Gaussian surface is. It's what's sometimes called matchbox style surface. You have top and bottom bases. Uh, it can be any shape. I prefer the rectangular shape. Here, really, those top and bottom surfaces are what we want. But to be able to apply Gauss's law, we need to connect them into a closed surface. That's really why the side surfaces exist. But as before, you see the surface normal, the surface area element points in a direction perpendicular to the electric field. So the flux through the side surface here will be zero. And true of all the other side surfaces. You are only really looking at flux of the surfaces at the top and bottom. And I want to be extra careful here and I want to say that I arrange this Gaussian surface in such a way that this distance here, call it z plus, is the same distance here, z minus. Because I want to be able to say, based on the reflection symmetry, that the electric field magnitude here must be the same electric field magnitude here. Otherwise, it would violate the reflection symmetry that you see. Okay, so with all those symmetries pointed out, let's go through the same motion as before. 
we are pretending that we are going to the, the left-hand side the integral of Gauss's law. And through the symmetry argument we made, we could reduce this down to essentially the integral over the top and bottom surfaces of the Gaussian surface. The side surfaces gives zero contribution to the flux. And we can see as before, the area element here is parallel to the electric field. So we can get rid of this dot product. And as we went over, along the top surface, the electric field has to be constant as to obey the translational symmetry. And the electric field along the top surface has to equal the electric field along the bottom surface so that the reflection symmetry is obeyed. What that adds up to is that this electric field value here is a constant. I can pull it out of the integral. So it's an integral over the area element of the top and bottom surfaces. Okay, so to be able to do this integral, I need to specify some parameters. Let's say that these top and bottom surfaces had area A. As I said, the shape doesn't actually matter. So I have two of those surfaces. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law becomes electric field times 2A. That's equal to the right-hand side. Here, the charge enclosed would be this amount of charge here. And in terms of given parameters, the charge enclosed should be the surface charge density times the area. So the right-hand side is bunch of constants times, huh, more constants. Hmm. Let me finish the solution here. Solving for the electric field, I get 2 pi ke sigma. The areas, the arbitrary parameters, having been cancelled out. This is a very interesting result for infinite plane electric field, that it's constant. It's not a function of distance. It's the plane is truly infinite then you can be as far away from the plane as you want, and the electric field won't change. In practice, what this means is, as long as you are close enough to the plane to be able to consider the plane as if being infinite, the small amount of distance change here doesn't change your electric field. You need to be far enough away that you can no longer consider the plane to be infinite. So that's the result. Um, in the version with the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught, this would be sigma over 2 epsilon naught. I just want to uh, point out one thing here, because later on you are going to see a similar looking but slightly different result. Later on you are going to see that electric field outside the conductor is equal to sigma over epsilon naught or 4 pi Coulomb's constant sigma. So you might wonder, what happened to the factor of 2? This is what I want you to remember. With the conductors, the electric field inside the conductor is 0. So if you have electric field here of magnitude sigma over epsilon naught. Look at the difference in the electric field. It's the same difference you see between the top and the bottom regions. At the top, the electric field is plus sigma over 2 epsilon naught, pointing up. At the bottom, the electric field is minus sigma over 2 epsilon naught, for the difference in electric field of the same amount, sigma over epsilon naught. Really what this is, is with the conductors, there are other charges in the parts of the conductor that I didn't draw. From those charges, if I didn't have this surface here, 
I would have gotten some amount of electric field pointing that way. And what the charges accumulated here does is it adds to the electric field outside of the conductor, yielding this value, and it subtracts from the electric field inside the conductor, giving us a zero electric field inside the conductor as required by static electricity condition. So this is the last of the applications of Gauss's law. I hope you see the simplicity of these calculations and learn to make this argument for yourself so that you don't have to do all that nasty integral you saw me do. Now, these applications of Gauss's law does have a limitation. Let me end with that. It's that it relies on symmetry. All the precise arguments we made you cannot make them if you don't have symmetry. So this is actually good for you because this means there's really only three types of symmetry that you can use Gauss's law on and use all three right now. Spherical, cylindrical, rectangular. So once you learn how to apply Gauss's law on each of those three symmetries, then you know how to apply Gauss's law in all possible situations. Until next lecture then, bye.